Welcome to the Transforming Lives panel, the podcast where inspiration and transformation converge. Each week, we come together to explore the depths of personal growth and life-changing experiences. Come along with us as we deep dive into personal stories. Through intimate conversations, our guests and panel reveal the pivotal moments that have defined their paths, shown their strengths, and formed their passions. We are so happy you are here, and we welcome you to our circle, where empathy and empowerment are always at the forefront. Welcome to another episode of the Transforming Lives Planet Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Charmin, and Mitzi is also here with us today. And we have a guest. But before I introduce our guest to you, let's just take a minute to be grounded and be centered so that we can be in unison for the next. 30 to 45 minutes. Join me if you're able to just close your eyes and take a deep breath in and just feel that breath and be present with yourself for this time and let go of the things to do, the challenges of the day, and all the things that can be a distraction for the next 45 minutes. Just breathe with us, take a deep breath in and hold that breath and feel the breath in your body and just let it go. And as you let it go, let go of every distraction. And then join us again in the room, wherever you are. Thank you for affording us the opportunity to be in your homes, in your car, wherever you're listening to the podcast. Thank you for joining us. And today our guest is Isis Fernandez Rojas. And she is a celebrated international writer, an esteemed Houston educator, and former journalist renowned for her impactful literary contributions. Her debut poetry collection, The Opposite of Breeding in Semen, Poetry and Pearls explores the complexities of existence, delving into themes of healing, identity, love, and mental health. As an accomplished writer, Rojas has left an indelible mark on the literary landscape with her nonfiction and memoir pieces, featured in esteemed publications like Dear Hope, Tough Post, and The Guardian. Her exceptional talent has earned her prestigious accolades, including the Owl of Minerva Award, solidifying her reputation in the literary world. She's a graduate of the MFA program at Goddard College. Join me in welcoming Isis. And I love the message that she left with us, that there is healing from trauma and mental illness, transformative power of love and exploring identity. Isis, welcome to the Transforming Lives panel podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Great. Is there anything you would like to add to your bio? I think the bio has done more than enough. <laughs> I Since May is Mental Health Awareness Month, um, I just want to 
want us to start there. Okay. What inspired you and led you to make the statement that there is healing for mental health? I think when we're discussing mental health, we tend to go to the dark places. Hmm. And rightfully so. It can be dark, but also there can be light in it as well. Mm -hmm. There can be knowing and knowledge, um, knowing of self, knowing of situations, right? Um, especially if you have something that triggers you, understanding and knowing what triggers you helps you understand who you are at a much deeper, deeper level than I think very other things do. Um, and so there is healing there, right? There is an, there's a healing, there's a knowledge of self, there's a knowledge of what is good for you and what is not good for you. And there is a, an awareness there um, that comes. So while we tend to focus on the dark side, we can't tend to focus on depression and um, suicide ideation, um, or we tend to focus on some people like to go super dark and focus on serial killers for some reason during this month. But um, there's also there's also a lightness there that we should also celebrate. And how does the healing from trauma and mental illness align or coincide with your literary work? Well, most of the work in the in most of the work in in the in the book is about mental health. Um, so I suffer from generalized anxiety and depression, um, and suicide suicide ideation, um, and so a lot of the work here, um, which took several years to do. So the oldest poem is from two thousand seventeen, uh, two thousand fifteen. And the youngest poem is from maybe about a couple of weeks before we went to press. Um, so we have a big range there. Um, and so during that time, you know, you have a, a lot of writing and a lot of, a lot of work on yourself. And um, so a lot of the poems here, a good chunk of the poems have to do with the exploration of mental illness, what that looks like, what that sounds like, how that intersects with things like identity. I am Afro-Latina. And so we have culture um, that plays with, with mental health, right? Um, if you are Latina, there's no such thing as having a bad mental health day. You're, you're just suffering of the nerves and you need to get up and go about your life. Um, and so, you know, we have the intersection of culture, the intersection of mental health, and, you know, and the other intersection of all other things dealing with love as well, um, with love and, and with existing in life. So, yes, a huge chunk of this work has to do with mental health. I want to thank you for being honest and vulnerable and sharing. Um, but one thing I like to say um you're not suffering with depression and anxiety and suicidal ideation. You're living with those things, right? Um, and I, I, I am going to enjoy the next 30 minutes with you <laughs> um, because oftentimes persons would embrace their physical illnesses and ailments and and hide their mental illness uh, because of the labeling and the stigma. Mm -hmm. Now, how or what motivated you to steer away from from um, being? the fear of being labeled and stigmatized? You know, that's a good question. Um, I am one who doesn't like people being put in boxes from things that they can't quite control, right? I don't think it's fair. Um, I made it a point 
once I understood what was happening, to be very open with everything, be open with my mental health. Um, and I don't know if it was, I was called to do so. I don't know if it was just a way of being an activist. Um, I don't, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I feel that um, there are many faces to mental health, um, many experiences. And the more we talk about it, the more we normalize things like going to therapy, mm -hmm. which helps so many people. The more we talk about it, the more we understand the signs we need to look for in our loved ones when they are feeling depressed or maybe on the point of committing suicide, right? We can't always catch it, right? But maybe we know how to, I don't know, say a kind word to someone who needs a kind word at a moment, right? Um, and by talking about it and not being, um, not kind of retreating into it, you're giving, you're giving it a name, right? It's just one of those, it's that saying that, you know, that, that things hide in darkness. Once you give it a name, once you know what it is, once you can identify it, then you can have some control over it, right? You Now you have some control, you have some agency. So um, after the first uh, panic attack, I had a, had a panic attack um, at an airport. Actually, we'll never forget it. My first panic attack was at an airport in Seattle. And I thought I was having a heart attack. Um, uh, it almost brought me to my knees. It was at a bookstore. I remember the bookstore. I remember where I was. I was remembering where I was traveling to. And I, it, it just hit me. Um, then uh, a couple of, I want to say maybe a couple of weeks later, there was another one. Um, had a coworker take me to, a, to the hospital because I genuinely thought I was having a heart attack. And... Um, the doctor said, no, um, you should probably go to your doctor because your EKG is fine. And no, we probably think we think this is a panic attack. Um, and so from that moment when I understood what that was and that how that's tied into lifestyle. And then once I started going to therapy and then like got became diagnosed and going through the whole process. People need to know. Because that hiding in darkness helps no one. I totally agree. Um, and I know that you will be an encouragement to our listeners, uh, especially those out there who are timid to identify with what they're living with because of the labels, because of the stigma, um, even in families that culturally does not understand, embrace, or accept mental illness. Um, what encouragement could you give to those persons who are from the Latina culture, from the Caribbean culture where, you know, um, mental health, you, you say I'm depressed. They're like, get it over, get up, take a bath, go take a walk. Well, that's a good question because what I don't want to say is, you know, don't listen to the people who love you the most who are telling you to get up and take a bath. So maybe you do need a bath. <laughs> but, um, but what I do want to say is that what you're feeling is valid. So do, don't think that it's not, right? If you feel that there is something wrong, it's because there is something wrong, right? And so your next step is always to find help. And you may not find it in your, in your home. You may not find it among your relatives and your friends. And that's okay because they may not know either. Um, or they may feel the same way and, and just dealt with it. So why can't you deal with it, right? Um, I would find help as where you can find help. Be, that's a moment, I think, to be very cognizant and aware of yourself. Really ask yourself a hard question. What is making me feel this way? Mm. 
who can I go to for help, even if it is just an ear to listen, and maybe they know someone who knows someone. Um, maybe I can go to a therapist, right? Or maybe the local doctor more than likely will know someone, right? I'm thinking about, um, I'm thinking about uh, my mother's in my mother's country. If I were living in the place where she grew up, which is a small little town in in Guatemala, how would how would I know to have gone to someone? And I I think definitely not my family <laughs> there, but I probably would have gone to the doctor there. And that particular doctor is very cognizant and knows um, knows the trials and tribulations of things and would would know where to go. Right? There is someone who knows. The hard part will be to find them because they may not be in your family. Yeah, I mean, you know, in the age that we're in now, one of the, I think, new resources available to people is using something like chat GPT uh, and asking the question about what type of resources or I'm feeling this way and what are some of the things that I could do if they can't easily, quickly find uh, some kind of a resource that they need that that might be at least a starting point. You know, when you were talking, you brought up something that um, really made me sort of stop and think was that, you know, that difference of how different cultures deal with depression, anxiety, mental health issues. I grew up with a mother who uh, had mental health issues and tried to commit suicide multiple times. Uh, and was hospitalized in and out of hospitals. And, you know, it's obviously very taxing on the person going through it, but it's also very taxing on the family and everything that's surrounding them. And, and you know, a big part of, you know, as you're speaking, it, something sort of tweaked in me, which is that, you know, when somebody has a broken leg or, you know, they've got the measles or something, people can see it, they can identify, you know, when it's mental health, it's, you know, what's going on behind the scenes in the innermost. And when you walk up to somebody, they don't see it like they see a broken leg. And so they don't necessarily understand it or readily accept that somebody is dealing with real anxiety versus just having a bad day or something like that. So can you give her a listeners, some of the um, pointers or things that have helped you in dealing with those types of issues? Yeah. Um, so I can, I can speak from my experience. Um, and so kind of the things that, um, that I do and that, and how do I know if it's like, I'm depressed or I'm just tired or I'm just sad. Um, it feels different in the body. Mm. Um, so when you lay down, being tired is one thing. You lay down, you're tired, you go to bed, right? You go to sleep. You're depressed. It's almost like your bones are sinking in to the mattress or the couch. It feels different in the body. That's how I know. Um, I know that there is usually um like uh my forearms start to kind of like um the, the word in Spanish, semenchina, but um, in English, it's like, uh, not quite like uh, chick like little chicken thingies, but like, it just, it feels different. It feels um, like a, like it's vibrating here. I, I'll feel it here. I'll feel it here. I'll feel it here. And I know that anxiety attack is coming um, or a panic attack is coming. Um, I, it'll, and it's also a pattern, right? Cause it's like, you're sad a day or two perhaps right um if you just broke up with someone it's probably a couple of weeks right but you can still see the positive things right you can still get up take a shower go to work or just sad when you're doing that versus i can't get out of bed the thought of getting out of bed and taking a shower is exhausting just the thought is exhausting to me um i cannot have hold a conversation or um i the thought of getting breakfast 
I love coffee. I'm a huge coffee drinker. The thought of making coffee for myself, overwhelming, right? And it's when that happens is that you need to pay attention because it's not just sadness, right? Sadness is temporary. Depression's a little bit longer. Um, so that's that's what I would look for because um, that's what happens to me. Um, and it's also, you know, you need to pay attention to your thoughts, right? Because for suicide ideation, it's always the thoughts that come in, you know, we have the feeling of not feeling worthy. Uh, I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough, pretty enough. That person hates me because I'm awful. I'm the worst person in the world. Like those type of thoughts start coming in when those stuff, you know, types of thoughts start coming in, which is different from, oh, I just wasn't good enough today or man, I could have done that differently. That's a different thought, right? But when you're you're really like attacking yourself and it hurts because it hurts like right here, that's where you need to pay attention. And it's not just you being mean to yourself, right? It's there's these thoughts here, they're they're literally attacking you. You are not the worst person in the world. You are worthy of being here. Um, and so pay attention, <laughs> right? You mentioned something else too, and, and um, I, I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on, which was certain things that trigger you. Uh, mm -hmm. So I know that uh, as an example, that sometimes it's the people that are around you one, not understanding what triggers you. And also, I, I've seen people very much be like, okay, like, if you know that that triggers you, then why are you still letting it trigger you? Like, I've seen people kind of like, talk that way to people. And I don't know how to, um, I, I'm not sure that I'm expressing it correctly. But I know that that was one of the things that was very hard as an example for my mother, that certain something would trigger her and, and my, you know, ex extended family would be, well, like, well, if you know it triggers you, then just like, don't do it or get over it. Or since you know it triggers you, you know that, that it's it's not real. It's just your overreaction to it or something like that. So, so can you talk about that? Because I think that that's really hard for the person who's going through it when they're triggered and other people aren't getting it. Right. No, it's very much real in your head, right? So it's just like the idea of like, well, you know, it's not real. You know, it's not a thing, but no, it is a thing, which is why I'm triggered, <laughs> right? It's very much real right in here. And it and it, you could logic your way through this 365, 24 seven, and it's not gonna work, right? It's just the way it's wired. It's just the way it is, right? And so who says that you're not doing things or you're doing things to not trigger you, right? You, what you don't have control over is how those triggers are going to come up, when those triggers are gonna come up. You only kind of have control over how you react, but not immediately. By that, I mean, for example, today's a perfect day. I got triggered today, absolutely got triggered today. Um, I got triggered at the post office of all places to get triggered. <laughs> Ironically, I was sending out copies of books and um, I got triggered at the post office. And it was, when I was done at the post office, I sat in my car and I literally sat there and I was like, I, I had to breathe through it. And you know, I have a certain, certain set of tools um, to help me through it, but I have a certain set of tools because I've been working at this for a long time, right? So the thing that triggered me, um, I didn't know was going to happen at the post office. When I woke up and I said, self, this is what you have to do today. Being triggered by the post office was not on that list, <laughs> right? It was not on that list, but there it is. And it happened and it's in your face, right? And so I, I, I walked, I didn't run. I walked quickly to my car and it took a minute. And I literally, you know, one of my tools is breathing, right? Just how we did the grounding breathing at the beginning was grounding myself. I'm a big proponent of gratitude, uh, of a gratitude ritual. And the gratitude ritual is a breathing exercises and grounding yourself in gratitude. So I did my breathing exercises and I and I talked to myself. Other people who probably walked past my car thought I was probably 
a little crazy and that's okay. I allow them to think whatever they want to think. You know, their opinion has nothing to do with me. Um, and I said, all right, so how are you feeling? What are you feeling? Why do you think you're feeling this way? What exactly triggered you? Why do you think it triggered you? Is this something that we need to call our therapist and get an emergency, <laughs> an emergency session, which I've done in the past? No, it, it wasn't that. And then, you know, once I really sat down and then I looked around, like I said, all right, I, what are, what are five green things? I see trees. I see leaves. I see this bird with the green feathers. I think, you know, what are five things you can smell? What are four things you can hear? You know, and now we went down that road and once I grounded myself and I looked around and I said, I was, I'm okay. I'm okay. That's only a drop. It wasn't a monsoon. It was a drop. And so then you walk away and you go about your life. Right. And so, you know, people, people can say what they want to say about things <laughs> and they will as they will. Um, but being triggered um, is all about kind of what happens, what triggers the memory, what triggers the reaction, what triggers the feeling, right? In this particular instant, it was the color blue. I'm wearing the color blue. My nails are blue, but it was the blue of the shirt of the person who was, who was, uh, who was helping me at the post office that triggered me. And there was, that was nothing I could have done. There's no way I could have like rearranged my day around that. There was just no way. And it's just, it is what it is, right? It's how you're dealing with those triggers. Sometimes you can avoid them. If someone triggers you, there is literally people who trigger me that their very presence, I just cannot be in the same space with them. I avoid them like the plague. No harm, no foul. I don't think you're a mean person, but there's something about you that just does not vibe with me. Can we just meet on email? <laughs> Can we just email things out? Um, can we figure out another way of doing things, right? So um, sometimes you can work around the triggers, but other times you just can't. And it's literally how you're going to deal with them. Does that answer your question? I felt like I went a roundabout way. <laughs> Yeah, no, 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 that was, that was helpful. Um, it, and I, and I guess it's like when, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to ask the question. So for somebody who's there, like, so say, for example, you're the guy in the blue shirt mm -hmm. and you're just, your very presence is triggering somebody because you're happened to be wearing a blue shirt or whatever the thing is like, sometimes the person can tell that they're triggering or causing anxiety to somebody and sometimes they can't tell mm -hmm. like what are are there signs that we should be looking for when we're dealing with somebody we know has anxiety to know that oh they're starting to have something that's triggering them or how can we help them adjust the situation so it's not triggering or some right. tools so you may not know that you're triggering somebody you just don't, right? Um, because different people, different lives, different stories of people in their in their stories and lives and triggers. This guy didn't know he triggered me. He still doesn't know he triggered me. I smiled <laughs> politely and then had my moment in the car, right? Again, not my first rodeo, not my first trigger. But for somebody who can't quite control it yet, right? You know, you want to kind of read some of the body language, right? You kind of want to read kind of, I do a lot of things with my hands. So if my hands are kind of like doing a weird kind of like, mm, yeah, it's not right. Um, I'm not making eye contact. Um, I'm not answering full sentences. I'm answering short sen you know, short words. Um, I feel like I'm in a hurry to get away. Um, those may be some things you might want to look for. And know that the trigger may not have anything to do with you. Don't take it personal. You may have triggered them, but it may not be you, right? And so all you can do is kind of step back. If you're seeing, if they're visually, like visually agitated, um, you may want to say, are you okay? Make sure they're fine and they're not harming anyone um, or harm to themselves is what I would do. So, um, and if they are, you might want to step back, let them have their moment. Right? Let them let them be triggered 
if they if they are not a harm to themselves, if there's into other people and there's nothing really you can do about it, you need to step back and give them the space, right? Because it again, it's not you, right? I I can't tell the poor guy at the post office because you will go in the back and wear a different color shirt. I just that's just not gonna happen. Um, it's just not gonna happen, right? Um, so if I didn't have my tools and I was triggered, he would probably be kind of like weirded out. Like, why is she, why is she crying all of a sudden? Like, all I did was put a postage stamp on her envelope and moved it to another part of the building. That's all I did. Um, it's it wasn't about it, right? And so let them have their moment. There may not be anything you can do. You just may have to make sure that they're safe to have them so they can go through the emotions that they need to feel for the trigger. And have you, have you explored or um, maybe tell us a little bit about cognitive behavior therapy? Because I, I know that I've heard that 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 can be helpful uh, in sort of, I don't, I don't think it's the right word, reprogramming the mind, but retraining or reeducating or well, I am definitely not an expert for cognitive behavior therapy. <laughs> I am not the person to ask. Um, I don't even, I'm not even quite sure if I'm in CBT right now. Um, so I'm, I, I yield my question to someone who knows a little bit more about it. <laughs> what, what are some of the strategies, the techniques that, help you to become so self-aware that today while in the the post office being triggered even though you were triggered you went to your toolkit yeah right yeah. but how did you get from the person who could have been triggered and started to cry there and everyone else don't know what's happening to this person that is self-aware and understand that I am triggered and I need to go to my toolkit. Good question. Um, so I've been at this for a while, right? This is more than 10 years. And I, have uh, you know, I was the person in the line crying after being triggered. So that happened. <laughs> that actually happened. Um, actually was actually in the middle of a grocery store when that happened. Um, so I was that person triggered in the middle of the grocery store. People have no idea why this grown woman is crying right in front of the mangoes. Um, but it's just experience, right? You know, the more experience and wanting to know more. So once I understood what was kind of happening, right, that there was a name to this thing, right? I wasn't going crazy or having a heart attack or, you know, it's just weird, right? <laughs> um, I I started to do some research and started to learn some things and what this is and trying to understand kind of how it works. Is this clinical depression or seasonal depression or just generalized, general depression? When you say generalized anxiety disorder, what does this mean? Is that different from like being bipolar? What does being bipolar mean? And so it's trying to answer those questions for myself. So doing some of the research and all the while, like really getting into, like, I can't say enough about therapy, <laughs> by the way, um, and getting into therapy, right? And understanding and learning from your therapist too. Um, so it's that being aware and understanding, like, you know, when I talked earlier, like I have this feeling that happens right here. I'm like, oh, there goes an anxiety attack, right? Um, sometimes it happens when I'm driving, which is scary, um, but it's the big, big bridges, I'm like, hey, I could, I could, I can, I like, I can barely breathe, and so I'm just like, okay, what this is hap what is happening right now is an anxiety attack. You are okay. Breathe. One, two. Three. So it's just like, it's that that awareness is just from just experience and time, and knowing that like, oh, when I feel like this, this is what this means. So I need to do this. When I feel triggered at the post office, I need to go to my car and talk myself through it. Do I cry? I cried actually. I like it wasn't a big cry, but it was a little bit like a like a teary watery cry. And then it was just like, all right, you are crying because you're triggered. You are crying because you feel this. You you're recalling this memory. Mm -hmm. 
right? And so it's just like, it's kind of almost like an equation, right? I feel this, this is why I need to do this. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think once you start thinking about that and those equations and how that works, right? Um, Then you know what you need to pull from a toolbox or if there's a tool that you need that you don't have, um, you start developing that tool. Um, And so you you have it when you need it, right? And so that's how I've been able to do it. Um, And having those little equations in my head, very, very helpful. Thank you so much. Is 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 the the growth, the self awareness, the understanding of self that leads you to choose the right tool? How do you choose your tools from your toolkit? Well, like today was today was the easy one, right? Because it's just like first I need to ground myself, so I can't make a deci- I can't make a decision. I can't ask myself questions until I'm able to breathe. So let's ground ourselves first, right? Um, some of these are actually some tools that therapists have given me. So if I feel like an anxiety or panic attack coming on, go run around the block <laughs> or go up and down stairs. You cannot have an anxiety or panic attack if you can't breathe. So it's like, and you're just tiring yourself out. So at that point, after you go up and down the stairs a couple of times, you're like, okay. <sighs> and then you're breathing, right? And so that's helpful. That has helped me. Um, like, uh, what those bubbles, you know, that they give at weddings, this little bubble Mm -hmm. bubble things. So if you're feeling something, come on, blow the bubbles. So that way the air, like your air is going one direction and that way you're like in control your breath. Right. That was an easy one. That was a, that was a cool one. When that one was introduced to me, I was like, oh, and then I, I, I would keep that. I would, I, I, my therapist gave me a vial and I would keep it in my purse and it spilled all over the purse, which I was like, oh, well, we can't have this. Um, we cannot have this. This is not working. This is not working. I'll just go run. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, it's, again, it's just experience and, you know, therapy and trying to understand, like the more, I'm a big proponent is if, of, if you can name it, then you can conquer it. Not that you're conquering things, you're living with, right? But if you can name it, then you then you can have a plan for it. It's when you can't name it and it's in the dark that it's the boogeyman. And like, you have no agency. It happens to you versus, okay, it may be happening to, to me, but I have control on how I deal with it, right? And so you want to empower yourself as much as possible. No, no, and, and this may be, and probably is different for different people, but it, it, is it, was it something that kind of crept up on you and evolved and all of a sudden you were having anxiety and panic attacks or was there, was there signs of it years before or was there a traumatic event that triggered it or like from your research when you, that you were doing from yourself, yeah. yourself, like, you know, could you talk a little bit about some of those aspects of things? Yeah, actually I can. Um, so the panic attack happened out of the blue. Like I was not expecting it, right? Um, and it wasn't until I started like really thinking about it, looking back at some things. And this is maybe a couple of years after that, after this incident where I was thinking, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. <laughs> um, uh, where it's just like, you know, that, uh, in this particular, at just in the same particular year as the panic attack, I actually was uh, gonna have uh, a procedure done. Um, and my mom had come into town to take care of me during the procedure, and something happened that we couldn't have the procedure done, and I was really upset. Not upset because we weren't doing the procedure, but upset because I had to go back to work. And I'm just like, ooh, ooh. Yeah, like that's the thing. People aren't upset because of things like that. If there is a procedure, that was a tell that you missed, right? That was a red flag that you missed, right? Um, it's stuff like that. It's stuff like how I would react to things, right? Um, I'm one who's just, you know, if there's a plan, we're gonna follow the plan and we're gonna go do this. And it goes step by step by step by step. And people who do step five 
before step four are the worst type of people. And my reaction to that is was always over the top. Like, I can't believe they would do this. I would never do this. And, da, 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 da. and I'm like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, that's like, that could be a type A personality or it could be, you know, one of those things where it's just like, you're so wound up so tight. Like everything has to be super perfect. Um, a lot of it is is cultural and um, not just cultural at home, but cultural in different spaces, right? School was 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 a, a big one that I didn't realize until later, right? That I had to be really impressive. I realized that like maybe a couple of years ago, I'm just like, oh, wow, like on paper, I'm really impressive, but in real life, I'm a hot mess. Why is that? Um, and it's just like, no, you're not a hot mess. Let's just, let's just call it what it is. You're not a hot mess. You're just an adult woman in America trying to make it. Let's just put that out there. But like you, you, you know, growing up, um, you know, I had to be this, I had to be smart. I had to be one of the smartest in the class. Um, I was the first in my family to go to college. Um, so I had to find a major where I made money, um, but still kind of liked what I did. Um, I had to be faster, stronger, better than every, all of my other peer, peers to be able to be seen in a certain way. Right. And so that also adds to the anxiety and the, and the pressure of that. Right. And so, you know, I can't, you know, the idea of like, oh no, it's okay if you mess up. No, I can't mess up. I have to be pitch perfect because the millisecond I mess up is a huge deal. Other people can mess up and be okay. I mess up, the world ends, right? That was in my head. And for some, in and in some situations, that was true. <laughs> in other situations, in all situations, it was not. And so that also had a lot to do with it. So when we're thinking about like what led up to this, um, could it be situational? Could it be hormonal? Yeah, both, right? Hormonal, yeah. My doctor said, ooh, okay, well, we need to do something with this, right? So you want, do want to get, get your checkup. Um, but it was hormonal and situational. And we work on them both. And I think you brought up a really good point, which is also going in, checking your blood work and checking those things because maybe it is hormonal or something physical or some underlying health condition right. that is, is, you know, coming out that way. Right. Because clinical depression and um, like and situational or seasonal depression, those are two different drugs um, to deal with that. Right. There's two, how I understand it. And I am not a neuro person at all. So take this with as much grain of salt as you can hold in one finger. Um, you know, those are two different neuroreceptors in the brain that's that's firing or misfiring, right? And so those are two different drugs you've got to take. Two different doses, two different everything, right? If you're clinical, if you're clinically depressed, that's a different path to take with your doctor versus a situational um versus a seasonal right? Seasonal is like, you know, winter months, you're kind of down. I don't know what drugs you take for that because I don't have seasonal depression, but situational depression, uh, yeah, you're you're taking your Lexapros <laughs> and you're taking your Walbutrins, right? Um, and so that's different than your clinical depression. That's, they're, they're taking something a little bit heavier, I think. Um, so yeah, definitely have your labs done. Yeah, you, you made an interesting point. I remember I had a really, really nice neighbors that they were from Argentina, were in Toronto, mm -hmm. and he was having seasonal depression in the winter, you know, the dark skies and everything like he was just every winter getting depressed and they ultimately ended up moving to Florida and he prospered and did great because, you know, he just he could not handle the winters and he used like a, like a, not like a sunbed, but like a sun lamp or something to kind yeah. of mimic the thing and it helped, but it wasn't sufficient. So they made the decision that they had to leave Toronto and move, to, you know, to where it would be sunnier more often. Right, right. right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Isis. In in the, you know, the last couple of minutes that we have, how did you get into the literary space? 
<laughs> I grew up in the literary space um, and grew up uh, meaning that like, uh, you know, I was a, I was a voracious reader, very, very young. Um, you know, part of my growing up was like, you had to, you know, like I said before, you had to be bigger, better, faster than everybody else. Um, one of the ways to be bigger, better, faster is to be a voracious reader. Right. Um, and so I was um, also learning how to manage culturally because, you know, again, Afro Latina in East Texas, which meant like, um, why are you a black girl speaking Spanish? I don't understand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And so um, I came to it that way and started writing. I want to say sixth grade, started writing creatively around sixth grade, um, encouraged by some wonderful English professors and English teachers throughout the way. Um, and, um, started, I would like to say that I started being really out there with my lit, with my literary life around the age of 19. I joined a group called Nuestra Palabra, Latino writers having their say here in Houston, Texas, um, where we would host showcases, reading showcases for other Latino writers, um, those who are local or those who are coming in from out of town. So I learned, I cut my teeth there. Like I learned a lot. Um, and then of course I was a journalist for a long time. So I learned how to write to deadline, to length, on time, what words to use, how, how it's like the, probably the best boot camp for any writer is to be a newspaper journalist for at least two years at a small paper, right? Don't go for the New York Times and stuff. Like you want like more attention because there's something about the editors at a small town paper um, who they could work a word, they can work a phrase, they can edit something so wonderfully and beautifully. And sitting at their elbow while they're doing that, I learned more that way than I did ever in the classroom. Yeah. Uh, ever in a workshop. So that's kind of, you know, you cut your teeth there. And then I went ahead, you know, saw the writing on the wall for journalism very early. Um, it was a different game when I was a journalist than it is now. Um, and saw and thought that, hmm, um, I'm probably not going to make this my career for too terribly much longer. And what do I want to do? And I've always wanted to write books because I've always been writing. I was actually writing a book at the time and decided to go get my master's degree. Um, the best decision I ever made <laughs> was to spend those couple hundred thousand dollars, not a couple hundred, but a couple of thousand dollars there uh, to get that degree because I'm using that degree every day where I don't really use my journalism degree much anymore. Um, and so it was the best program at the best time for me. And consequently, it's one of those trips back from Goddard to to where I was living at the time, which was Shreveport, Louisiana, is where I got the panic attack. And um, yeah, and so we were down up, down to the races and kept writing poetry and write a bunch of different things and kept getting published. And here we are. Where can we find your your literary work? Well, you can find me at my website, isisfernandez.com, which has links to the book if you want to get a copy of the book um, and other pieces that I've written. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing with us your personal journey, journey and giving us insight into some of the tools and the strategies that you've used and that our listeners can use uh, and try if they're experiencing anxiety or panic attacks, you know, just taking that moment and breathing and grounding yourself, finding a quiet space on your own and giving yourself the time and attention that you need to work through whatever it was that triggered you. Um, such, such great advice. And thank you so much for sharing your personal journey with us. Thank you so much for having me. I so enjoyed, I so enjoyed sharing. Okay. Thank you, listeners. We will see you next time. All of ISIS information will be in the show notes.
Thank you so much for joining us today on Transforming Lives panel podcast. We hope that you receive some nuggets of wisdom and seeds to plant along your journey of transformation. If you enjoyed what you heard today, we encourage you to let us know and to share us with those that matter in your life. If you would like to connect with anyone from the panel or our guest speaker, you can find all of the ways to connect in our show notes. We have so much gratitude for you, and we are so thankful to be a part of your day. Until next time, take great care.